In 2018, we checked out a vast array of third-party controllers for home consoles. Among the 20 plus that we tested, we found some truly great controllers that could be considered suitable replacements for the real thing. But there is also no shortage of awful, ridiculous, and downright hilarious controllers that we wouldn't even subject a second player to. If you're like us, the notion that first-party accessories are the best bet has been drilled into you from a young age. In most cases, first-party controllers are simply made better and are usually never topped. The evolution of official controllers for any given system can actually be quite interesting, and sometimes virtually invisible changes can make a big difference. Of course, there's a lot of these to cover. So in this episode, we're taking a look at the first-party controllers from the NES, on up through the 16-bit consoles, and the Neo Geo. original Nintendo Entertainment System was an absolute phenomenon in North America. It seemed like nearly everyone of a certain age group had one, or at least knew someone who had one. And playing NES for the first time with my cousin when I was, I think, four years old, is maybe my earliest vivid memory. And until she handed me this little corded doohickey, I had no idea that Super Mario was a character that I could actually control on a TV screen. And life has never been the same since. So, sure, it might be fair to say that I have a bit of a nostalgic bias toward the NES and the original rectangle controller. But, of course, the NES controller was itself preceded by the original Famicom controllers in Japan in 1983. While overall similar in design, the most obvious difference is that the Famicom controllers are hardwired to the rear of the console and rest in little notches on the sides. The wires are extremely short, only about a foot and a half long, minus around nine inches if you consider the run from the rear to the front of the console, which means Japanese players either sat very close to the TV or had to run the console's power and RF wires across the room. It's a design decision that does not hold up very well today. Only player one has start and select buttons, but overall the feel is pretty similar to the NES, aside from the sharper corners on the D-pad. The slightly rounded edges and the ridge that runs around the controller feel nice. I wonder if Japanese players have nostalgia for a cord running between your fingers. Player 2 has a microphone, which is most famous as your weapon against the rabbit-like pulse voice enemies in the Japanese version of The Legend of Zelda. But otherwise, this feature was barely used, which explains why a mic was not included on the NES controller. Now, I'm sure that there are a lot of abused NES controllers out there, but I've generally found the NES controller to be surprisingly precise given its age. The buttons on all of mine still feel super fresh. Now, whether Nintendo actually invented the D-pad, or control pad as they prefer to call it, is a subject of some debate, but Nintendo inarguably made it the standard that it is today. While some may prefer Genesis, Saturn, or PlayStation D-pads, Nintendo's D-pads tend to be the common high bar that all others are judged by. And while the general consensus is that Nintendo has stumbled with the Switch Pro Controller D-pad, the NES D-pad hangs with the best of them, suited for everything from quick dodges and punch out to eight direction aiming and contra. The key is the central pivot in the molded plastic of the D-pad, which allows for more precise and natural movement versus pressing down buttons on a flat surface. I've been through a lot with this controller. It's become a universal symbol of gaming that is recognized by millions around the world, young and old, gamer or non-gamer. And I've always favored the notion that limitations breed creativity, and the simplicity of the NES controller is still one of the most appealing things about the system to me. You don't need a bazillion functions for a game to be fun, and you can still do a lot with just two buttons. Pressing up and B to throw sub-weapons in Castlevania still feels so right to me, even when later entries allow you to set them to an extra button. The two-button layout encouraged NES developers to cut the fat and get to the point, which makes it a very approachable console to this day. 
But the iconic rectangle is of course not the only first party controller design for the NES. The NES Advantage was released in 1987, and as is obvious from its appearance, this is an official arcade style controller for the NES. Now, I have to be upfront here. I only went to the arcade every now and then as a kid, and I am absolutely terrible with joysticks. They just feel so unnatural to me compared to D-pads, so I'm not the right person to judge this controller at all. But that said, I do love the overall design. It has a nice heft and just feels downright sturdy, even by Nintendo standards. The ball top stick doesn't have the micro switches that hardcore arcade fans crave, but the buttons do feel quite nice, to me at least. Of note are the turbo toggles. They even have speed dials, which is a really cool touch. The slow toggle button, of course, simply pauses and unpauses the game rapidly. The NES Advantage can actually plug into both controller ports optionally, so the player switch allows for passing the controller in take turn style multiplayer games. While I never use it for serious play since I'm a D-pad man through and through, the NES Advantage just looks cool and even has a bit of utility as a rudimentary lag testing device thanks to its LEDs that light up when the A or B buttons are pressed. Then there's the NES Max. It's hard to believe, but yes, this is a first party controller. Model number NES 027, released in 1988. I'm sure this controller has its fans, so I'm gonna to try to go as easy on it as I can. There are some forward thinking ideas here, like the handlebar shape that wouldn't become standard until the mid 90s, or the handle texture that didn't really become a thing on first party controllers again until the PS4 and Xbox One. But the overall layout is a bit cramped for adult hands. NES Max's claim to infamy is the sliding circle that freely moves around in its eight-way directional input. Maybe this later served as a sort of inspiration for the 3DS's circle pad, but the key differences are that on the NES Max, the circle does not spring back to the center, and also that simply moving the circle around does nothing. You have to apply pressure to register input. Now, if you could just simply slide your thumb around, I could maybe see the appeal. I mean, who hasn't had a sore thumb in the morning after an evening of Ninja Gaiden? But it feels like I have to constantly, consciously apply pressure for it to be enough. You can also simply press the black ring for directional movement, but that's no replacement for a proper D-pad. And on top of that, the distance between the A and B buttons, now set at a downward slant, is just about 1 16th of an inch wider, which might sound like almost nothing, but to me it makes rocking my fingers between the buttons feel a fair bit less comfortable. Turbo buttons are a nice bonus, but not enough to make up for my difficulties in using this admirably experimental, but woefully imprecise controller. So the NES has a fair number of first party controllers, but putting aside controllers not really meant for general use like the Zapper Power Pad or the very rare hands-free controller that was designed for those with limited hand mobility, there is one more NES controller we want to talk about here. But I think before we get to that, it would make sense to talk about the next generation first. The Super Famicom launched in Japan in 1990 and brought with it two standards of controller design that few companies, save for Nintendo themselves, have dared to deviate from since. Most notably, the diamond button layout where the thumb's home position for most action games is over Y and B at a natural upward slant. In contrast to the Famicom and NES, but similar to the Game Boy, all four buttons have a slight convex hump. Secondarily, two shoulder buttons were added, R and L. While nearly all modern games use shoulder buttons and triggers heavily, many Super Famicom games use R and L only for very minor functions, if at all. When viewed from the side, you'll notice a subtle downward slant, which when combined with rounded sides, makes for one of the most ergonomic yet elegantly simple designs in game controller history. 
The D-pad is slightly larger compared to the NES and Famicom, and just a bit easier on the thumb. Like the Famicom, the Super Famicom controller is pretty short, only about three feet, but luckily it is plugged into the front of the console. For North America, the console was given a divisive redesign. The controller, however, remained much the same, aside from a new color scheme, a cord more than double the length, and an ingenious little tweak that's easy to miss. B and A are convex, like on the Super Famicom controller, but Y and X are concave, like NES buttons. This gives the tip of your thumb a cozy little nook to rest in on Y, while rocking the joint of your thumb downwards toward B feels comfy with no hard edges. Many people consider this to be the ultimate controller for 2D games. SNES controller responsiveness was a bit of a concern for mine for a while because my original two controllers from 1994 started to feel a bit mushy 12 or so years later. On one of them in particular, the start button and down on the D-pad were becoming nearly unusable. An easy way to test SNES controller responsiveness is to use Kirby's Avalanche or Puyo Puyo, which have input tests in their options menus. And you know, there are a lot of knockoffs out there, but despite the simplicity of the SNES controller, they never measure up to the real thing for me. I spent a lot of money and effort trying to find a used but fresh feeling authentic replacement, but no luck. So I finally resorted to buying a new inbox late generation controller on eBay about 10 years ago. It came in this box with Super Mario RPG artwork. And wow, what a difference. It was completely worth it. It had been years since I'd felt an SNES controller that felt so fresh. Although I've actually now come to question, had I ever used an SNES controller that did feel this good before? In truth, this controller might feel so good not just because it was unused before 2008 or whenever I bought it, it might be because it is a bit different, better perhaps than my original controllers ever felt. The distinguishing characteristic of this controller is that it has an engraved Nintendo logo instead of the printed Super Nintendo text. Well, years later, I learned that our good friend Game Dave was also aware of the greatness of this engraved logo controller, and that's because his original console was the smaller SNES console, which was released in 1997 after the N64 was already out and came with the engraved controller. And sure enough, upon closer inspection of my controller's box, it all makes sense. Copyright 1997. The model number is also different from SNS005 to SNS102. After trying Game Dave's much used childhood controller, which felt every bit as good as my own engraved controller, I realized that these very late SNES controllers are just flat out better. D-pad and button presses feel just a bit more precise, not mushy, but not clicky either. While they are not that easy to find, if you too are tired of looking for a fresh SNES controller, keep your eye out for the SNS 102 with the engraved logo. But if you'd like to restore a mushy controller to a better state, the only solution really is to buy new rubber contact pads. I bought two sets of these from console five for less than $3 each. After I took apart my most dire original controller, I soon spotted the problem. The indentation where the rubber D-pad dots make contact with the circuit board were starting to come loose. For this controller, I did a full replacement of the rubber pads with new ones. The verdict? It works perfectly now. Every button and direction registers effortlessly. There's a slightly more clicky sound to the controller since the buttons now have a bit more of a spring back to them. It's slightly different from the feel of the engraved controller, but not particularly in a way that I would describe as good or bad. Start and select are black instead of dark gray, so it doesn't quite look stock, but I guess that's fair since it's not exactly a stock first party controller anymore. But for now, this will be my solution for SNES controllers gone mushy, but the real verdict will be in another 20 years to see if the new pads have lasted as long. Marry me with my money.
So with all that said, we return to the final NES controller, model NES-039, colloquially known as the NES Dogbone. This was the pack-in controller for the 1993 NES and Famicom redesigns, which were presented as budget-friendly alternatives to 16-bit consoles. <laughs> Notably, this means that the new Famicom actually received NES controller ports and regular rectangle controllers do work, although zappers do not. The Famicom and NES dog bones are otherwise identical aside from, you guessed it, a seriously short cable on the Japanese version, but it's nonetheless an improvement over the original Famicom controller weight. The new systems, often dubbed Top Loader NES and AV Famicom, are coveted for their reliability and suitability for modding, but the dog bones are also sought after on their own for their curved design that no doubt takes after the SNES controller. The SNES DNA doesn't stop there either. The D-pad seems to be the same molding and texture as the SNES D-pad, and the slanted start and select buttons make the whole thing feel a bit more 90s. Here's the thing though, I also really wanted one of these controllers for a long time. And like everyone else, I looked at them and thought, wow, how ergonomic compared to the old pointy rectangle. But you know, I have to be honest, after getting the dog bone, I just never could feel quite at home with it. And it gave me a renewed appreciation for the classic rectangle. I unwittingly bought into the hype and saw the dog bone as a solution to a problem I didn't have. The deal breaker for me though is the slant and spacing of the A and B buttons. Sure, the Game Boy has a slant too, and you don't see me complain about that, but I've recently realized that the real problem is the spacing. Like the NES Max, the buttons are again about a sixteenth of an inch farther apart than on the original controller, which combined with the slant makes it feel like such an insubstantial part of my thumb rocks over the A button as I hold the B button in action games. In contrast, Game Boy buttons have the same spacing as those on the original NES controller. So I hate to be a bit of a naysayer here, but the Dogbone controller is simply not for me. I respect those of you who do love it and those of you who hold the NES rectangle in such a way that it digs uncomfortably into your hands, but we'll just have to agree to disagree. Unlike Nintendo, who came out of the gate with a nearly perfect controller, it took Sega a bit longer to find their footing. They'd obviously become a real powerhouse in the arcade, where each game could be designed around a custom control scheme. But at home, it was a different beast. A control pad design, much in the same vein as the Famicom, made sense. But there was one major obstacle. Nintendo had patented the cross-style directional pad, so they'd have to come up with an alternative that wouldn't get them in legal trouble. This was not only a problem for Sega, but for everyone else until it expired in 2005. The control pad, included with the Sega Master System, is a fairly close approximation of what the competition had, but it differs in some key ways and comes across as a pale imitation. For as much as I appreciate the Master System and its games, the controller doesn't exactly rank as one of my favorite things about it. The rectangular size and general layout mimics the NES controller at a glance, but the action buttons are spongy and lack tactile resistance. It's fine for games like Space Harrier where you're jamming on one button constantly, but with something like Alex Kidd and Miracle World, it's much less preferred. The omission of expanded functionality buttons in the center, like a start and select key, was a major detriment too. I doubt there's a single Master System fan out there who didn't lament the choice to put the pause button on the console itself. Obviously, the real eye catcher here is the D-pad, or as Sega liked to call it, the D-button. The slightly concave square is ergonomically sound, but the lack of defined angles across a sizable control surface makes it tough to get your bearings at times. There is a central pivot, but the travel distance is so shallow it may as well not even be there. Not good. The only clear benefit to this style of pad, I mean button, is the ease of access to diagonals. 
which is good for games that use the dreaded up to jump, like Lord of the Sword. Early versions of the pad had a removable rubber plug at the center of the D button that, once removed, could let you screw in a tiny plastic joystick. Finding one of these in decent condition, much less complete, is fairly challenging these days. Of course, if a control pad wasn't quite your style, then you might be inclined to go with a more familiar tool, such as an arcade joystick. Sega was happy to oblige with the control stick. This right here was the second controller I received for Christmas along with my Master System. I mean, I thought it was going to be awesome. Look at it. But something fell off right away, and I hated it. Now, I'm sure you've already noticed what the major problem is with it, but I never realized it until years later when I reacquired my childhood control stick from a friend that, yep, it's backwards. I'm not quite sure what Sega had in mind by going this way with it. I don't know, maybe it was a way to appeal to Atari fans, who were used to using their right hand for character movement and left hand for button presses. Annoyingly, the rounded square head of the stick seems to come loose fairly easily. Since it's held in place by a screw, you might need to open up the whole thing and tighten it from the inside. For as difficult as it was to adjust to using this back in 87, it's especially tough to use today because it goes against 35 years of muscle memory. Sure, it's fine for slower paced games, but action games? Forget it. However, if you're left-handed, you might want to give it a try. But chances are, it's going to feel wrong from what you're used to at this point as well. Part of the problem with the Master System pad is that Sega hadn't quite found their identity in the home market just yet. But things were about to change big time. When their 16-bit follow-up console was on deck, they couldn't stress enough that everything was going to be bigger and better than those puny 8-bit machines. And that wasn't just limited to graphics and sound either. I'd never even considered that you'd ever have, much less need, more than two action buttons. But when I held the Genesis 3-button controller for the first time, it was a true revelation. A step up from the Master System in every conceivable way. This was no toy. It was a big controller for big kids. An increase in the face buttons surely had to do with Sega's desire to port their System 16 arcade games to the console. Games like Golden Axe needed a three-button control scheme to match the arcade. And Altered Beast, being the pack-in, demonstrated the benefits of the new controller firsthand, with separate buttons for punch, kick, and jump. Surely, the additional buttons would come in handy for future developments. The buttons, I mean, <clears throat> triggers, are lined up in a slight arch. Most games have button configurations in their option menus, but my preferred layout was to put jump on C and attack on B. A could then be assigned to switching magic and less immediate functions. The D button has also been hugely improved with a circular or disc-based shape with a pronounced up, down, left, and right cross. Diagonals are still present, but recessed to avoid confusion. Instead of molding a central pivot on the underside of the plastic, Sega opted instead to put a ball bearing in the rubber membrane. Since the Genesis is backwards compatible with Master System games, it makes sense that it uses the same DE9 port for controllers and other peripherals. But if you didn't have a power base converter, then the controller could also be used on a Master System console as well. Although it might be incompatible with a handful of games in the library, I'm willing to bet that most people chose the Genesis controller to play Master System games after this point, and I don't blame them in the slightest. It's worth mentioning that although the DE9 connector was used on a lot of other consoles and computers at the time, that doesn't mean you can just plug it into anything with that style of port. It's wired up differently inside, and in some cases might damage your console or computer, so make sure you do a little research beforehand. There were a number of variations of the three-button controller that popped up during the course of the system's lifespan. Most of the differences are cosmetic, but a key difference is that the plastic of the D button was altered to include a central pivot molded into the plastic. A definite improvement, but since I prefer the coloring of the Model 1 controller, what I've done is taken various parts of different versions and made what I feel is the best three-button pad. Of course, there's also sub-variants with longer cores and different textured plastic on the directional button so there might be room for further improvement. In the years since I last used it as my primary Genesis pad, 
I'm struck by just how much larger the three button controller is than I remember it being. It must have been absolutely massive to an 11 year old. Still, this is the iconic Genesis controller. When people think of the system, chances are that this is the controller that they associate with it. As with the Master System, Sega released an arcade joystick to complement the abundance of arcade ports on the Genesis. In a similar fashion, the arcade power stick marked a sizable jump in quality from its predecessor. It's solidly built and has a metal underside to give it extra heft. The buttons have a striking resemblance to actual arcade buttons, and each of these have a dedicated rapid fire toggle and one main slider that manipulates the rate of button presses, making it great for shooters. A first impression would be positive, and it complements the Genesis aesthetic to a T. Unfortunately, looks can be deceiving. The primary downfall of the arcade power stick is that it uses carbon conductive silicon pads to activate movement, much like a typical control pad. While it's fine in a smaller form factor such as those, a joystick has increased travel distance making it less responsive and soft feeling. Clearly this was a cost saving measure, but supposedly the Japanese version uses micro switches, which would have elevated this to an essential peripheral. As it is though, it represents one of the more ill conceived purchases of my childhood. The release of Street Fighter II in arcades signaled a major shift in gaming culture upon its release in 1991. The Super NES found itself in a unique position to receive the first home port due to the six action buttons on the controller that matched the number of the arcade game. Although the button layout didn't match exactly, it was still incredibly playable. In fact, it might be blasphemous for some, but a four face and two shoulder button layout is actually how I prefer to play the game. But I digress. The fact is, if you wanted to stand a chance in the console scene during the early 90s, you had to have a version of Street Fighter 2. Sega knew this, but their three buttons put them at a disadvantage. Sold separately for around $20, Sega unleashed the six button control pad alongside the release of Street Fighter 2 Special Championship Edition in 1993. The two rows of three buttons mimicked SF2's layout exactly, although the game could be played with a three button pad if you wanted to have a horrible time. Of course, Street Fighter wasn't the only game to take advantage of the new X, Y, and Z buttons, but it was primarily a deluge of fighting games that followed in its wake that did. Nonetheless, some non-fighting games did use the extra buttons to expand functionality if you happen to have a six button on hand. Although I personally prefer the comfort of a diamond-like layout of four face buttons, having six face buttons at your disposal might have meant that the pad was intended to be held in a more arcade-esque manner to give you quicker access to certain button combinations, but I just can't do it. The circle-shaped D button has been redesigned with a totally different style of central pivot mechanism, almost like an inside-out version of the tried-and-true nub extrusion that nearly everyone had adopted by this point. It feels a touch mushier, but precise nonetheless. Of note is that a small handful of games, such as Golden Axe 2, will not work with the 6 button in its default state. The fix for this is the Mode button, which will switch the pad into 3 button mode if held when booting up the game. This should cure most incompatibilities, although there are exceptions, like Forgotten Worlds. The six button arcade pad, model MK1470, is an ultra compact redesign that was included with the budget level Genesis 3 console in 1998. Not only has the mode button been moved next to start, but it also incorporates slow motion and rapid fire functionality. The latter of which is an all or nothing ordeal, making it relatively useless for most games. The buttons are closer in size and color to each other but lack any sort of concave or convex surfaces. This can make it tougher to differentiate during more hectic moments on the more cramped controller. Now the D-pad matches the original six button pretty closely, which makes it look a bit silly and disproportionate. Pushing it in a direction is a bit steeper, which is nice, but it's possible to push the entire thing down in the center, where it gives the impression of little to no central pivot. 
It's obvious that these were made on a rock bottom budget, which makes sense considering that the Genesis 3 retailed for around $50 in 1998. While I personally don't prefer it, I've run into several people who consider this controller to be their favorite. But before we put a <clears throat> button on the whole Genesis era, let's take a quick look at those new retro bit Genesis controllers that just came out a little while back. I know what you're thinking, those aren't first party, get them out of here. And yeah, that's true. But these were reportedly made with Sega's original molds. So I was curious if they could be considered exact replicas or not. These were sent over to check out thanks to Castlemania games. There's two different color variants a normal black, and a transparent crystal blue. Outside of the 10-foot cord, there's no obvious giveaways that allude to this being anything other than an official first-party controller. Once in my hands, the first thing I noticed was just how good the buttons felt. My original is over 20 years old now, so I can't even remember what it felt like when it was new, you know? But in the case of the D-pad, while it looks nearly identical, and the plastic has that same texture, I noticed that pushing down in the center causes the entire thing to sink in, which makes it feel closer to the six button arcade pad, although not quite as extreme. Just to make sure it wasn't because of the newer rubber membrane, I put that in my original six button and everything was totally fine. Which leads me to believe that while these pads supposedly use the same moldings, there's been some slight alterations here and there. Either the central plastic post is a touch longer or the well that the pad sits in is slightly deeper. Sega sure had come a long way since the Master System pad, and the first six button controller was basically perfect. These days, the greater capabilities and smaller size make the basic six button pad into what is generally considered to be the go-to controller on the Genesis. And that's something I'd agree with. PC Engine family of consoles may have been marketed as 16-bit for their 16-bit graphics capabilities, but the 8-bit HUC6280 CPU actually has more in common with the Famicom and NES. When the PC Engine was introduced to Japan in 1987, many saw it as a worthy upgrade to their Famicom, and the types of games that are popular on the console do in many ways feel like an extension of what you'd normally see on the Famicom, but with a wider color palette. From that perspective then, it makes sense that PC Engine manufacturer NEC didn't exactly rock the boat when it came to the system's controller design. The two button layout along with a D-pad and start and select buttons, or rather select and run, was similar to what Japanese consumers were used to using with platforms like the Famicom, Sega Mark III, and MSX Computer. The 1 and 2 buttons are virtually identical to the A and B buttons on the Famicom and NES controllers. The controller is wider than NES controller with rounded edges and a slight upward incline at the top that's comfortable to rest your fingers on. But something feels missing, right? Where's the turbo in turbo graphics? Well, model PIPD001 was succeeded by PIPD002 which simply adds three-way turbo switches for buttons 1 and 2. NEC also shipped similar controllers that have different model numbers, which match the color schemes used by some of the alternative PC Engine models, such as the Core Graphics and Core Graphics 2. I've always been a bit unsure whether auto fire buttons should be considered cheating, but I appreciate that it's practically part of the PC Engine's identity. Turbo is an official function of the system's flagship controller, so no guilt in using it. The North American Turbo Graphics controller is, for all intents and purposes, identical to the Japanese Turbo Toggle controllers, aside from the black plastic shell and a bigger controller plug. 
the cord isn't even that much longer than the Japanese version. The good news is that PC Engine controllers can be extended with a pretty standard cord. Some people refer to it as a Macintosh serial connector extension since it was pretty commonly used on those computers. Both the Japanese and TurboGrafx plugs are standard DIN sizes, so you can find extensions and converters for both. But speaking of the DIN plugs, the most disappointing design flaw of all PC Engine and TurboGrafx models is that they only have one controller port. You need a multi-tap for even just two players. Like I said before, I appreciate that two-button controllers lead to restrained and unbloated game design. And I feel like I should like the first-party PC Engine and Turbo Graphics controllers, but there's just something about the D-pad that I've never been able to get totally comfortable with. The disc design is similar to Sega's controllers at a glance, but it's smaller in size, more akin to like an NES D-pad. And I've just never been able to feel as in control with this little disc D-pad as I do with an NES, Genesis, or SNES D-pad. But that's just me, I've only been to the PC Engine for a few years now, so take that with a grain of salt. But it does make it one of the very few systems for which I primarily use a third-party controller instead the Hori Fighting Commander PC, which was not the only six-button controller released for the platform. The PC Engine Duo RX, which combines the Hucard and CD-ROM hardware into a single unit, shipped with NEC's very own six-button controller. No doubt the overwhelming popularity of Street Fighter II forced their hands so that the PC Engine's own version of the game could play like fans expected it to. Round one, fight! But outside of that, the number of games that can actually utilize more than two face buttons seems to be fairly limited. In fact, a toggle switch is used to flip the controller back to two button mode because otherwise you'll have compatibility issues with unsupported games. I don't have this controller, but Corey does, and he tells me that while the D-pad is larger, it feels like it has a shallow pivot, and it's not his favorite. Japanese controllers have an HE system logo on the front, which is also on the PC Engine system itself. As far as we understand, NEC Home Electronics was kind of like a separate company under the NEC umbrella, and the HE system logo was licensed out to third parties so they could make official accessories. And in some cases, this has made it a bit difficult to determine what is truly a first party controller. For example, here's one that's a bit on the fringes, but is still pretty much a first party controller, the Avenue Pad 3. Along with a similar six button controller called the Avenue Pad 6, this was made by NEC Avenue, yet again, a separate company, but one owned by NEC. The Avenue Pad 3 doesn't exactly add any new functionality, but button three can be mapped using a switch to either run or select, which makes it so that action functions that might be on either of those buttons can be more comfortably reached during gameplay. Otherwise, the Avenue Pad 3 is just about what you'd expect from a standard PC Engine controller, although the one and two buttons are a bit higher up. There are a lot of PC Engine and Turbo Graphics controllers, including some joystick controllers, but we simply just don't have all of them to show off here today. But regardless, NEC made a plethora of simple but serviceable controllers with built-in rapid-fire functionality that supported the PC Engine's excellent library of games, and the company's short-lived moment is one of the most successful companies in the Japanese video game market. In 1991, while the Genesis was doing its best to deliver arcade quality ports at home, SNK stepped in with the Neo Geo, which literally delivered arcade games at home, as long as you could handle the Mega Shock for the price tag. The Neo Geo was a dream come true for dyed in the wool arcade fans, but what good is the hardware if you don't have a quality joystick to go with it? Housed in jet black plastic with gray and gold accents, the Neo Geo arcade stick was both robust and high quality 
symbolic of SNK's dedication to the platform, but also able to endure an insane amount of wear and tear. One, two, three, four, hit! Its aesthetic of four face buttons, a ball head joystick, and start and select buttons is pretty subdued. But it's the inside that matters, and that's where SNK really delivers. Using a square gate micro switch delivers immediate, precise, and natural feedback. The gulf between the Genesis stick I talked about earlier and this one could be a mile wide. The buttons, on the other hand, well, they don't give quite the same impression, but they're not bad or anything, just a bit loud. At first, their arrangement might seem a bit weird since they're laid out over a steep, arching incline, but once you rest your hands on the body of the controller, it's completely natural. Some of the more hardcore fans out there have taken it upon themselves to put in new buttons that are a bit less distracting and match the arcade color scheme. For the most part, the AES stick remains the de facto standard for Neo Geo games. It's a jack of all trades, working for every genre of game on the system. There's definitely a reason it's so highly regarded even today. But then again, that might have more to do with the fact that there weren't any alternatives. That is, until the more budget-friendly Neo Geo CD arrived in 1994, with two brand new controllers in tow. For those that are interested in a more typical, console-style experience, the Neo Geo CD pad takes the size and layout of a typical control pad and infuses it with a mini thumbstick that adds some of that spicy arcade flair, creating a unique, if awkward, mashup. Once again, the key is in the micro switches, with each movement giving off a satisfying click. But it does take a bit to get used to. I found that it's at its best with games that allow for eight direction movement, like shooters, or overhead running guns like shock troopers. The only quirk is in the ordering of the buttons, which aren't quite to my preference. For diamond styled layouts, I prefer two primary buttons to be vertical from each other, like Y and B on the SNES. However, I do like that the color coding has finally made its way from the arcade cabinet. And then, you have the Arcade Stick Pro, a more compact, colorful joystick that fans have nicknamed the Kidney Bean due to its pleasant, curved shape. Oh yeah. Thankfully, it retains the micro switches, but the top of the joystick itself is a bit curious. It's a ball head, but the top has a concave groove. Supposedly, this stick was aimed at being more comfortable for run and gun games, like Metal Slug. The button layout matches the arcade cabinet more closely with a horizontal spread but combined with the proportions of the stick, you might find that the palm of your hand hangs off the side. This seems to be the biggest complaint with the kidney bean stick. It's simply too small and cramped compared to the luxurious real estate of the original. There was a time when the Arcade Stick Pro was more common and less expensive than the other options, but I'm not so sure that that's the case anymore. These days, most who are just getting into the Neo Geo will probably end up with a bean stick since they're more widely available and cheaper than any of the other options out there. It's worth noting that the original Neo Geo hardware uses a standard DB15 connector for its controllers. This port has since been adopted over the years in nearly all super guns, which are specialized hardware for playing arcade PCBs at home on a TV or monitor. So over the years, a clicky stick has become synonymous with SNK hardware. Whether it be an actual arcade joystick or a mini nub on the Neo Geo Pocket, I say that most fans agree that it's a defining aspect of anything that they release, which makes it all the more baffling that when SNK released a replica of the CD pad alongside the Neo Geo Mini in 2018, it lacked any sort of clickiness. Thankfully, a diligent modder who goes by the name of Magic Trashman had an awesome idea. Why not take these fresh new controllers and swap out the mushy stick with a clicky micro switch one? And while you're at it, replace the USB-C cable with a DB15, so you can use it on original hardware. Sounds like a great idea in theory, but is it as good as the original CD pad? Two, one, go! Like, 
the Neo Geo arcade stick, the original CD pad uses a square gate to define and limit the movement of the stick itself. If you try to do a complete circle with the stick, you'll clearly see that you're confined to square movement. However, the stick used with the mini pad mod doesn't have any sort of gate at all. You can do big, wide circles with it all day long, but at the cost of stick travel distance and responsiveness. It's essentially like an analog stick with digital characteristics. At first, this might not seem like a big deal, but in practice, it's simply nowhere near as good as the original. It feels way too slippery and ultimately laggy because of how far the stick has to move to engage the micro switch. After using it for a while, it was manageable, but I could never quite get fully used to it. The other difference to note is the button layout. While hardcore fans might scoff, this is exactly what I was looking for. Finally, I can lay my thumb vertically across the A and B buttons. Perfect for jumping and shooting a metal slug and more. It honestly feels great for most games. Now, I wish I could have this button layout with the original thumbstick. So while this mod does a good job of loosely emulating the feel of the original pad, it's not exactly comparable. Of course, this is no fault of Magic Trash Man's mod itself. It's just that the new design of the stick is too far removed from the original to accurately incorporate something closer. He did the best he could given the inherent limitations. So although I didn't care much for it, who knows, there might be someone out there who prefers it more than the original. Over the course of a decade plus, Nintendo, Sega, and their competitors brought 8-bit gaming to new heights and virtually perfected 2D game design in the 16-bit era. And that competition resulted in two of the most popular and enduring button layouts in gaming history, the diamond and the six button, enough for any game designer to build an engaging game around. The next time we visit the subject of first party controllers, we'll see how these types of controllers met the needs of 3D gaming and where Nintendo, Sega, and newcomers to the gaming market took things from there.